have so much to be thankful for. Uh, the, the sun came up over the horizon today. Uh, it would do us well to take stock of all that God has done. If you make more than $34,000 a year, you are automatically in the top 1% of worldwide earners. You woke up today. You have a roof over your head. You have food in your stomach. And you have a church family that loves you and a church family that you can love. And most of all, we give thanks for Jesus, right? Because in Jesus, we have forgiveness of sins. We have hope for life today. We have hope for life eternal. We have hope for tomorrow. God's love flows from a well that never runs dry. So give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So with that, take your copy of God's Word. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 as we look at verses 17 through 32 in a message I've entitled, A New Walk. Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. As we look at the context for the passage today, let's be reminded of what Paul is doing in the course of Ephesians. Again, the first half of the book is dedicated uh, to what it looks like uh, to have a, a spiritual identity, particularly a spiritual identity in Christ. And then he gets to the second half of the book telling us how to live that spiritual identity out. And where does Paul go when he begins his focus on the Christian life? He begins in Christian unity. As we talked about last week, Paul spends a significant part of the first half of chapter 4 dedicated to unity, unity as a body of believers. But in today's text, Paul shifts from talking about unity to some moral injunctions that are made with a discussion of the church. Christians have moral commitments, those things that they should do, those things that they should refrain from. Those commitments not only give credibility to our witness, but they protect our unity. So read with me, beginning in verse 17, if you would. Therefore I say this, and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity, for the practice of every kind of impurity, with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of, of the truth. Therefore, putting away lying, Speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Christ has saved you. Now shed the old and walk in the new. That is our main idea this morning. Christ has saved you. Now shed the old and walk in the new. One of the biggest TV programs probably a decade ago uh, that came on was called The Biggest Loser. I many of you may have seen this show. The contestants show up obese, and over the course of the season, they are asked to lose as much weight as they can, and the winner is those who uh, has a relative weight loss as compared to their other competitors. As they are given a specific diet, a specific exercise routine, the help of personal trainers and dietitians. They morph right in front of your eyes. When it comes time for the season finale, they put up their before and their after pictures. They don't even look like the same people. In today's text, Paul is asking us to be the biggest losers. To shed the persona of who we used to be. To shed the lifestyle that we used to live. And to step into the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. And so look at, with me at verse 17 as Paul contrasts the old and the new. He says in verse 17, Therefore, in light of all I've told you in the first three chapters about what it means to be in Christ, therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. 
I testify in the Lord. This is Paul with his left hand on the Bible, raising his right hand, saying, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'm telling you this morning with an exclamation point, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Don't walk like they walk. Don't live like they live. He is demanding that converts to faith in Jesus no longer do the things that they used to do. And how are their former ways described? They're described as futile. Their former ways are described as futile, worthless, and meaningless. And Paul is acknowledging here, in some respect, Christians in the church as in Ephesus were living as they used to live. He wouldn't have to talk about this if they weren't. And he's telling them, don't do that anymore. So the lesson applies to us as well. Don't do that anymore. Uh, baby Christians will not come out of their salvation experience immediately sprouting fruit. Spiritual fruit, like all fruit, takes time to bear. Fruit is born over time. It comes with faith is watered by the word of God, is heated by the sunlight of the Holy Spirit, and is in the safe greenhouse of Christian community. That's how fruit sprouts. Fruit is born in the maturation of the believer. The new believer is justified in Christ, but they now need to be, as we all do, sanctified by Jesus. And that takes place over a lifetime. And Paul knows that. But his emphatic urging here is a pleading not to remain in the same place where Jesus found you. Don't stay there. Don't keep doing these things. Remember, the town of Ephesus is much like the town of Las Vegas. It was a commercial center. Lots of money. Lots of pagan influence. The Temple of Diana loomed large over the presence of that city. Ephesus was a spiritual place, but their faith wasn't in God. And Paul is calling on those believers in Christ to live so differently than the world around them that they would see Jesus in them. And that's a word for us too. And I testify to you with an exclamation point, no longer live as the partiers on the strip live. Their thoughts are futile. In verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. You almost have to read this verse backwards to kind of get a really sense of what Paul is trying to say here, the flow of it. The hardness of their hearts is this state of petrification. It's the state of decay. And as you read this verse backwards, you get a sense of what Paul is saying. They have hardened their hearts to the place where they have now become ignorant. And they're in their ignorance, they have now become excluded. And in their exclusion, they can't see the light of the gospel. Their perception of the reality of who God is has been darkened. But the very premise, the very foundation of their exclusion begins with a hard heart. The petrification of their heart. It cannot be pierced. They've determined that they're going to disobey God. Think about the brilliant minds of our day, the Elon Musks of our world. They're not intellectually ignorant. Many of them probably got a perfect score on their SATs. They win Nobel Prizes. They're sending people into space. They're doing other things that enhance human flourishing. And yet, many of them have determined in their mind that they are going to harden their heart. So they can be as brilliant as they want to be, but they're actually, with a hardened heart, become ignorant. Ignorance isn't a mental condition, it is a spiritual one, and it flows from a hard heart. So many young people, most especially, want to study apologetics. They want to become winsome, they want to have winsome answers to the concerns of the culture, and apologetics is a noble endeavor. You should be able to give a reasoned defense of your faith to an unbelieving world, but at the end of the day, an effective apologetic will never pierce a hard heart. It's only the Holy Spirit of God using the Word of God that can soften a hard heart. The hard heart became callous. The callousness in view here is almost an orthopedic type of callousness. Imagine a broken bone that's reset by an orthopedist. It actually forms a callus where the break used to be, and that callus actually becomes harder than the original bone itself. And so when the callus is set, it becomes hard, and that hard heart is heartened to the place where they reject God over and over and over again to the place where it can no longer be pierced. And in that callous state, they give themselves over to promiscuity, that is sexual immorality, for the practice of every impurity with a desire for more and more while never truly feeling satisfied. You see what's happening here? The hardened heart will always choose temporary pleasure. Why is it temporary? 
Because in their consistent want for more, they are demonstrating that they never have enough. They're never satisfied. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're looking for fulfillment in a one-night relationship. Maybe you're looking for fulfillment in a long-term relationship. Maybe in a slot machine. Maybe in a needle. Maybe at the bottom of a bottle. The hole in your soul will never be filled by any of those things. Only the filling power of the Holy Spirit can leave you satisfied. This is why they wanted more and more. Because what they got while giving them temporary satisfaction could never fulfill them. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Their hearts were callous, and their whole being was incapable of appreciating the gift that God offers in Christ Jesus. See a lot of adjectives being used by Paul here in verses 17 through 19. He's giving us a picture of those who are far apart from Christ. And since he's writing to the church, those in Christ should have a picture that's different than those who they used to be. It's almost like in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, when he's talking about who we were before Christ, or in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following, when he's talking about those who give themselves over to the desires of their flesh. In that same way, Paul is recapturing the depravity of what it looks like to live separate and apart from Christ. But notice he's talking to Christians here. He's talking to Christians about who non-Christians are and what they look like. He didn't walk into the Bellagio and say, hey, you ignorant people with your hard hearts, you're getting it all wrong. He's not talking to non-believers, he's talking to believers. If you want to get a picture of how Paul talks to, to non-believers, go to Acts chapter 17 and his message on Mars Hill. In that environment, he says, people of Athens, I can see that you're extremely religious, though you're worshiping the wrong God. He has a little bit more diplomacy when he's talking to non-believers. Here he's talking to believers who should know better. Paul knew that he was talking to non-Christians, and he's doing so in a way not to persuade them, but he's doing so in a way as to get their attention. He hits them with a rhetorical sledgehammer. So when Paul is talking in verses 17 through 19, he's cutting to the chase, but then he makes this abrupt shift in verse 20 as he shifts from talking about the old life to the new life. And he says in verse 20, but that is not how you came to know Christ. You almost get the sense of a parent calling you out by your full name. Charles Adam Millette, that is not how you came to know Christ. There's the, the you here is personal. It's prophetic. You know better than that. That is not how you came to know Christ. Picture a mom correcting a group of kids and uh, it's mixed in with her kids, and she talks to those who aren't her kids, and says, hey, I I'm not talking to you, and then she pivots to her kids. That is not how I raised you. That is not how you came to know Christ. It's not how you came to know Christ. You are better than that. Verse 21, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Paul's use of the name Jesus here should mean something to him. If you follow Paul's writings, he doesn't use that name a lot, the personal name of Jesus. He typically refers to him as Christ or Lord or the Son of Man, all which refer to a messianic fulfillment. But the personal name of Jesus, as he does here, directs our minds and attention to the cross and the resurrection. And then in verses 21 through 24, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Do things completely different than you did before. Take the progressive deterioration of verse 22 and replace it with the perpetual renewal of verse 23. The progressive deterioration of the old self is to be replaced by the perpetual renewal of our minds. The spirit of God is renewing is the only hope to restore the fallen image of God. In the, in the fall in chapter 3 of Genesis, the creation that was corrupted can now be renewed. You want to know what we were created for? We were created for a relationship with God. To have a relationship with God. And that relationship can only thrive, 1 John 1, when we walk in the light as he is in the light. And he describes the old life at the end of verse 19 as promiscuity and impurity. But when he describes the new life, he describes it as righteousness and purity. Righteousness and purity don't carpool with promiscuity and impurity. 
The old life in verses 17 through 19 is characterized by the hardness of heart. The new life in verses 20 and following is characterized by a renewed mind. I want you to take note of this. When he's talking about the unbeliever, he's talking about the heart. When he's talking about the believer, he's talking about the mind. Why is that? Because the believer already possesses God in his heart. The Holy Spirit already resides in his heart. The heart is not contested ground for the believer. The question now is, are you going to allow the spirit that already lives within you to renew your mind? When disciplining our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, sometimes we try to reach their heart through their rear end. And the Proverbs are clear that corporal punishment and other punishment, discipline, is not only has its place, but it is in fact good. But our goal is not merely to have dutiful children. We want our children to give their hearts to Christ. Because a changed heart will result in a changed life. There was a show that came out on MTV a few years ago, and I realize I'm talking to a crowd that some of you have never watched MTV. Uh, Some of you have watched MTV, but it was all like shows. It was never music. I, I get that. The show that I'm referring to was called Pimp My Ride. Maybe How many people have heard of that show? Okay, I'm not alone. Here's the gist of the show. They would go to somebody's house. They would take their old clunker car. They bring it back to their shop. They put new paint on it, new wheels on it, new spoiler on it. Maybe put a booming stereo in it. Maybe even some flames down the side, right? And what you had at the end of the show was a $1,000 car with about $5,000 worth of upgrades on it. I remember watching this week after week and thinking, they're putting an awful lot of money into a piece of car. And here's the point. Paul is not asking you to put a spoiler on your old life. He's not asking you to trick out the old you. He's urging you to be the new creation that Jesus has made you to be. Not the former nature refurbished, but a totally new creation. And you see this transition from the old to new has implications. In fact, earlier in the service when I read the Ten Commandments, The first verse goes something like this before the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you out of slavery. And then he goes on to give the Ten Commandments. And here's the implication. Your relationship with God has responsibilities. Because God brought you out of your slavery to sin, you should have no other gods before him. Relationship requires responsibility. In verses 25 and following, Paul gives us our responsibilities. Here's your application for the day. Therefore, in light of everything I've just told you, verse 25, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Put away lying. He isn't simply referring to just telling a fib. He's talking about all unwholesome talk. Since you are a new creature, put away all forms of speech that are not the truth. In other words, if you're tempted in your mind right now to believe a truth that is not as in Jesus, that is actually contradictory to the truth, and you should put it away. If you believe anything that opposes the truth of Jesus, you're actually participating in untruth. Not just fibs, not just unwholesome speech, put away all untruth. Speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. This is Zechariah 8.16. In the body of Jesus Christ, we are members of one another. We are connected to one another. We are neighbors to one another. We owe each other the truth. Some people have taken this as their commission to keep it real for keeping it real sake. And sometimes they exceed their commission. But we do owe each other an honest discourse. We do owe each other the bluntness of saying, Brother, I think you're living in sin right now. What you're doing is outside of God's design. We do owe each other... That, for we are members of one another, we belong to one another, and this should lead to open and frank conversations. Number two, contend for the gospel. In verse 26, he says, be angry and do not sin. That conjunction and is significant there because it lets us know it is possible to be angry and not to sin. And when you're angry, don't be angry for your own sake. But be angry for the sake of the gospel. Be angry for the sake of Christ. Contend for the gospel. When we get angry, it should not be on account of personal attacks on us. We shouldn't be angry because someone insults us. 
We should not be angry because someone doesn't listen to us. We should not be angry because they got their way and we didn't get ours. Getting angry over any one of those things is pride that thinks we deserve better. And that pride is a sin. But if we are to get angry, we should get angry in defense of the Lord, in defense of the gospel, in defense of the church, and in defense of God's word. I was highly insulted a few months ago when another church here in Las Vegas wanted to call themselves King's Church Las Vegas. If there were a church plant coming into the area, I felt like initially they should know better. They met me personally. They know our churches here. In every way, this is disrespectful. But being disrespected isn't a good enough reason to be angry. What made me angry, what made me confront them, was the fact that King's Church isn't just a name on a sign or a brand on a website. It's a people. It's Heather. It's Carmen. It's Jaden. It's a people. King's Church is who we are, and it's whose we are. Righteous anger is connected to a righteous God, not unrighteous pride. So the next time you feel like getting yourself wound up about something, make sure it's on behalf of the Lord and not on behalf of yourself. Be angry, and in your anger, do not sin. There's a way to live that out. There's a way to talk about these things. Paul calls us to number three, seek understanding. Seek understanding. He tells us in the latter half of verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, if you have an issue, go to that person and talk to them about it, and don't give the devil an opportunity. The connection here is that he's calling us to go to people, Matthew 18 style, about the issues that we have with them. And those issues aren't just because we got our feelers hurt. The issue is if they have sinned against you. They have to be things that are detrimental to the body. And so when we go and talk with them, we should do so with a measure of expediency because the longer that you delay in talking to someone, it actually gives the devil an opportunity. Rather than going to them and resolving it, leaving time and space in between you, it actually gives the devil an opportunity. Maybe it's something completely small that if you would have just addressed it right away, it would have been fixed. How many times have you gotten a text message, Facebook post or an email or even a letter in the mail? And you're wondering if the person on the other end dislikes you or has a problem with you. Maybe that's just the way that you read the message. Those written forms can't convey body language. They can't convey your heart in the way that it can over a phone call or in person. And so what do you do in response? You fire off another letter. You fire off another text message. You fire off another DM. What would happen if instead of writing them, we just picked up the phone and said, hey, I got this from you. I don't know if this is what you meant by it, but I just wanted to talk to you about it in person. Just that little step of going to them in person or over the phone can be the difference between a ruined relationship and a fruitful relationship. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let time elapse before God, doing what God has told you to do. Fourthly, do honest work. Do honest work. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he's to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. Stealing here isn't just banging out the window of somebody's car and taking their radio out, though it's at least that. Stealing here means every kind of misappropriation. Maybe it's rounding up on your time card. Maybe it's claiming an expense on your tax return that you're not eligible to claim. Maybe it's watching bootleg copies of movies. Every kind of misappropriation is included in this verse to no longer steal. But here's the contrast to stealing. Instead, do work, do honest work with your own hands. The implication of this verse is that a failure to do honest work amounts to stealing. That if you don't put forth effort and work, you are effectually stealing from somebody. Compensation without perspiration is stealing. Do honest work. What's the whole point of this honest work? So that you can have something to share with anyone who is in need. The things that God has given to you are not just for you. They're for those of you to share with those who have need. God didn't bless you merely because you're oh so cool. He didn't bless you for your own sake. He blessed you for the benefit of others so that you could be a conduit of his grace. Number five, don't grieve the spirit. Don't grieve the spirit. Verse 30, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. 
there are a lot of ways that we grieve God's Holy Spirit, and we'll get into some of those ways in a few weeks. But the fact that he has the conjunction and, starting off verse 30, lets us know in this particular respect that the grieving of the Holy Spirit comes when we use foul language. I mean, verse 29 says, No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. Don't use unwholesome or rotten language. He's not just talking about cursing here. In fact, he elaborates on the particulars here in verse 31. Let all bitterness, anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. So the foul language is gossip. It's malice. It's the water cooler talk that doesn't build up the name of Jesus Christ. Put it away. No foul language should come from your mouth. So, so if no foul language should come from your mouth, what should come from your mouth? Well, look at verse 29. What is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear? In verse 32, here's what builds up people. Kindness, compassion, forgiveness. Those things should be on your lips. Those kind words are a grace of God to those you're speaking to. Your tongue can be a grace of God in someone's life today. What grand thing that God would choose to give us a mechanism in our tongue to confer his grace. He's given you those lips not to push people down, but to lift them up. Notice that Paul takes the time not just to say the the Spirit or the Holy Spirit, but he calls it God's Holy Spirit. It's almost like he's given the formal name here. He's trying to emphasize the importance of the Holy Spirit. And by emphasizing the importance of the Holy Spirit, he necessarily emphasizes the importance of not grieving him. Don't grieve the very person of God who saved you, sealed you, and is your inheritance. Let all bitterness, that is the opposite of sweetness, pass from your lips. Let all anger and wrath, a.k.a. rage and shouting, no boisterous speech, that's noisy swagger. All of these things grieve God because it draws attention to you instead of him. Let it all pass away. But when you forgive, you draw attention to God. When you're kind, you point people to God. When you're compassionate, you demonstrate the compassion of God. I mentioned the biggest loser earlier. There was a young lady by the name of Danny Allen who was the winner of season 14. She went from 258 pounds to 137, from a size 22 to a size 4. She lost 121 pounds and 46.9% of her body weight. And that didn't happen overnight. It took work. It took discipline. It took accountability. It took mutual encouragement. It took establishing goals. It it took tracking those goals, rewarding herself when she did well, and pushing herself when she did not. And I want to be clear here. Paul is not saying that if you discipline yourself, you're going to earn your salvation. He's not saying that if you work harder, you work your way to Christ. He's not saying that if you encourage each other, establish goals, and track your progress, that you will earn the favor of Christ. What he's saying here is he's speaking to the church in Ephesus. So he's speaking to people who have already received the grace of God in Christ. They are believers. They have been saved. He's saying to them, the believer's life is Ephesians 2.10, purposed for good works. So do work. So do work. In light of the salvation you've received in Jesus Christ, discipline your body. Discipline your mind. Discipline your mouth. Have a plan to grow into the new life that Christ has given you. You're not just going to happen into graciousness. You're not just going to back back into good speech. You're not going to understand the Bible by one sermon or by osmosis. Some of you need to start doing some things. Some of you need to stop doing some things. In the same way that discipline is required for physical transformation, it's also required for spiritual transformation. The disciplines of giving, prayer, Fasting, worship, scripture reading, and service are all ways that God has given us a roadmap to walk in our new life. A.W. Tozer says, The spirit-filled life is not a special, deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. Christ has saved you. Now shed the old and walk in the new. If every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I just want to lead us into a time of invitation Some of you need to start doing some things. Some of you need to stop doing some things. In the power of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. So if you don't know God, and he doesn't know you, 
then I'm not asking you to clean up your act. I'm asking you to know him first and foremost, to give your heart and life to Christ, to take him at his word, believe him, profess him with your mouth, and be saved. And in that salvation, you can hope to do some of the things we've talked about this morning. But please don't hear me say that you need to fix your mouth and then Jesus will accept you. That's not it. This morning, Christ will accept you right where you are. The message of this sermon is he doesn't want you to stay there. He didn't save you so that you can continue in your sin. He saved you so that you can have a relationship with him. And so this morning, that's what your invitation is to respond to Jesus. Respond in obedience to walk in the new life. Respond to his invitation for salvation. That whoever may believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This morning you've heard the gospel, the the bad news of your sin, the good news of Jesus, the hope that awaits us in heaven and the hope that we can have now, the life that we can have now. All of those things are possible Jesus Christ. And so I just want to invite you to respond in that way. In a moment when we sing, you can slip out to the back and talk with me. If you need somebody to pray for you, there's plenty of brothers and sisters around here that would love to pray for you. I'd be happy to do that as well. But don't leave here today without walking with Jesus. Father, I'm asking you this morning to do a miracle, to do something in somebody's life that they totally didn't expect and frankly didn't want when they walked in here this morning. So God, would you save them right where they're at? Lord, would you put your finger on any sin that exists and would you allow them to walk forward in obedience to you in the same way that you have saved me? God, I pray that you would save them. Lord, we thank you for all the things that you've given to us, but we thank you most importantly for our Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Hey, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're a part of what God is doing here at King's Church. We wanna invite you to respond to that. You can give online at our website, kingschurchlv.com. You can download our app at the church app and search King's Church Las Vegas. You can reach out to us with a prayer request and we'd be happy to pray for you. Whatever God is doing in your life, we wanna be a part of that. We wanna further you along in your journey.